Welcome everybody. I'm Kalani and this is a talk about how to be of service in music and sound. Uh, I did another talk about how to be of service in music, which is a topic I think many of you are wondering about. There was a comment from one of my patrons about uh, somebody he knew who was a sound healer. And so I want to talk about that whole category today because when I did the first talk, I didn't talk about that category because I feel like it's different and I'll get into that in a second. So I did a talk about how to be of service through music. I talked about music therapy, becoming a certified therapeutic musician, bedside musician, music volunteer. There's lots of categories uh, over on the music side of things. So this talk is to address something that I think gets conflated with music therapy sometimes, um, which is sound healing or sound therapy. And there are many different words used to describe it. So let me tell you what I'm going to cover, what I'm going to try to cover in this talk, and that is what is sound therapy or sound healing generally? Um, how is it different than music therapy and other music-based services? Uh, who can do sound healing? Who receives sound healing generally? And what are some ethical considerations? And then within touching on all of those things, I'm, you're, you'll just get my general take on it. And I do want to say right off the bat that um, I don't do sound healing, although I have received some different services that you would categorize as sound healing or vibrational therapy, or there's different words to describe it. And that everything I say in this talk is my opinion based on my experience as a musician, a music educator, a music therapist, and somebody who knows people and who, and somebody who, as somebody who works with people who make instruments for sound healers or sound therapists, uh, and, you know, just my general uh, life experience in that area. I also want to make it clear that if I say anything that seems controversial or even critical, I'm not talking about any individuals, organizations, instrument makers, anything specific. All right. So I realize that I might have some pushback on some of the things I'm going to say, and that's fine. I don't mind talking about or debating or discussing or exploring any ideas, beliefs, uh, suppositions, premises, any of that, uh, as long as it's kept res respectful. So that being said, let's get into it. So what is sound healing? Sound healing is a general term that we could use to describe, you know, ancient practices. I mean, these things go back since people were making sounds, I suppose. Um, and the idea with sound healing is that certain sounds or certain combinations of sounds and vibration, and this is where it gets a little tricky, is, is a vibration, a sound, not necessarily, but let's just keep it simple for a second and say a sound, right? that particular sounds have particular healing qualities. And those have to do often, and this is the story that is told, is that those sounds often will affect us in specific uh, and predictable ways to encourage healing, to bring about a, a, a greater sense of peace, you know, just move us in a direction that we consider to be positive. Um, and that was also part of my definition of therapeutic music making. So I guess sound, sound healing or sound therapy is like therapeutic music making. It has the same general goal, which is to, let's just say, enhance our lives um, physically, cognitively, emotionally, or spiritually, or a combination of those things. And also to mitigate uh, you know, any factor in those domains that we, that we don't want, right? To relieve ourselves of stress, worry, anxiety, pain, discomfort, all that stuff. All right. General category. Um, so we're talking about sounds. And so, yes, music is made of sounds, but sounds are not necessarily made of music, right? So it, we're taking an aspect of music, which is sound, and we're saying this is now our domain, and that's why I think it's a little different than when we talk about music. And yes, some of the instruments are used in both. And that's where they can become conflated. But if you think about it, um, taking a part of one thing, just because there's a bridge between two things does not mean that, you know, 
the, the Venn diagrams are not overlaying, overlapping circles, all right? <laughs> so they're two separate circles with a little bit of overlap in the middle, which could probably be thought of as the instruments themselves. Aside from that, the premise of sound healing is that, like I said, a sound or maybe combinations of sounds, um, different frequencies, different vibrations, all of the above, affect us in different ways. Um, so let's just leave that for a second and move on to um, answering the question, so how is that different than music therapy? Well, if you go watch my and listen to my talk about being of service in music, I talked about volunteering to play music. I talked about music therapy. You know, we use music in different ways to help clients who are in therapy. I talked about uh, certified therapeutic musicians, uh, bedside musicians. Uh, there's a few different terms that are used in that way. That all really uses what we think of as formalized music, which is usually a song, a melody. You know, it's, it's highly organized, stylized, codified, uh, personalized, customized. <laughs> Um, it, it's music. It's what we think of when we say, oh, let's go hear some music. You know, that, that's what we're talking about in that category. Now, does that mean we don't ever do what I just did to open this video and play a sound to maybe relax or focus or meditate? No, we do that as well. But, um, but we're generally talking about songs, melodies, you know, music, things that are familiar in the music domain. In sound therapy and vibrational therapy or vibrational healing, um, what's on the table is usually the, the sound of an instrument because of its vibrational qualities. Um, sometimes people refer to the actual frequencies of the notes as the kind of main healing factor. Sometimes that also relates to vibrations, uh, vibrational healing. So there's it's, it's just kind of uh, coming at the healing uh, from a little bit different perspective, a different lens. We're not talking necessarily about things that you need a musician to do. Um, and if you're thinking about getting into this as a profession or a service, that's good news for you because there's basically no, there's no hurdles. There's no, there's no gate to entry. Um, you can just start doing it, uh, which has pros and cons. Uh, the pro is that you could start doing it the con is if you're going to hire somebody to do it, who are they? What is their experience? You know, and we'll talk about that a little bit later when we get into the ethical considerations. Um, who receives sound therapy or sound healing and what, what does that look like? Well, in general, the people who are receiving sound healing or sound therapy are what we call typical people. They're not people in therapy as you know, they're not people in hospice so much. Um, so they're not in the healthcare category. They're more in the spa, let's go to the spa, let's get a massage, let's go, you know, soak in the in the hot tubs. It's more like that crowd, and which is most people really. Um, and uh, who doesn't like to put themselves into a spa environment. So I would say, and I'm not saying this is the any of these are exclusive, uh, or exhaustive what I'm talking about. There's, of course, there's exceptions. But I'd say in general, the people who receive sound therapy, sound healing, are going to be just average people, typical people who are not necessarily going because they have a specific uh, therapeutic need and they're, you know, that's recommended by a doctor or something. They're not going to physical therapy, but they'd like a massage or something, right? And so that's kind of your customer. Um, what does it look like? It, it could be a lot of different things. You know, the crystal bowls, this is, this is a, a metal bowl, obviously, but we have crystal bowls, we have uh, gongs, which have become very popular in recent years. There's stringed instruments, monochords, there's people that work with tuning forks, there is um, synthesized sounds that people use, there's, you know, people that built tables with speakers in them that also have a physical as well as an aural component. Uh, it's just, you know, there's a lot that, that could be used there. Generally speaking, the environment, and you guys probably know this, I'm, I'm probably just speaking to the choir right now, but um, the environment is also important. So you're, if you go to a sound healer, sound healing, or you want to set up yourself as a sound healer, uh, the environment is also part of that. So it's probably sort of spa-like, right? Like maybe there's a massage table, there's uh, incense or candles and and it's it's very nice and the setting is beautiful and the lighting is is just right <laughs> because it is I think more like a spa experience and if you've gone to a gong bath or sound healing crystal bowls you probably noticed that that it's environmentally consistent 
um, and environmentally considered as a whole. So um, why do we go? Look, why do we why do we go to the spa? You know, why do we go to relax? We go to be cared for. And I think that's also part of a big reason that people consume that particular product. It's nice to have somebody just paying attention to you and doing something for you. And, and with, you know, with, and, and conversely, to get into that uh, on the service side, uh, to put your attentions towards helping somebody and putting good energy out there and just trying to do something that is beneficial for people. So that's all wonderful. Um, let's talk about why, well, I'm going to talk about why I think sound healing has a place and an appeal uh, in a market. Now, there's a few factors, but one big one is I think, and this is not meant to be a slight, uh, is that it's the placebo effect. I, I believe that. And I want to say that I don't think there's anything wrong with the placebo effect. I think if somebody tells you that if you lay down and they play the gong or the bull or the didgeridoo or the crystal, whatever, and you lay there and you receive that and that you will get some healing that probably more likely than not, when that's over, you're going to feel better. Because you had the intentions, they had the intentions, you gave yourself the time, the place. Were the sounds really the thing that, that was doing it? We don't know. Um, none of this is really measured that well or, or quantified, but that's, that's okay. I mean, you, you took the time, maybe you paid some money, donation or whatever, and you did that, and you did that for yourself, and somebody else helped you do that. So if it's beneficial, I don't really care why, it, you know, if it's scientifically proven or not. I think it's probably more of a placebo effect. Um, that's just me, but we can argue about that later. Now, there is some science. I would say it's pseudoscientific. People have been trying to study this, you know, the effects of different sounds for a long time. Um, you can do your own research. I mean, it's like researching anything online, you know, good luck. <laughs> okay. But... Um, what are some ethical, now that we're talking, we're kind of moving into the ethical considerations part of this. So, you know, anytime we charge money for something, um, because the theme of this is being of service, but then I know some of you actually want to get paid. So I just say this, um, anytime we do anything and we charge money or we enter into a transactional relationship, a service for some benefit, some consideration, um, we, have to, we have to entertain some ethical questions, you know. Is what I'm saying, what I'm selling, uh, valid, real, tested? Uh, and, and if it's not, then maybe consider using language, you know, that, that, that doesn't, you know, cross that line uh, where you're making promises or you're telling people things that you don't really know are, are verified or true. And there's ways to do that, certainly. Um, like anything, like, like food or medicine or, giz, you know, gadgets, there's always stuff out there that uh, people make claims about, and this is no different. This is no different of an area that, that where people could say it's, it does this, or it, it affects your chakras, your energy, or your, your whatever, your neurons, or whatever. Um, just take all that with a grain of salt. It's not that important. It, people generally need to, if you're selling something, and this is another part of the equation, is a lot of this is driven by the instrument makers and the people who sell the instruments, and they have a vested interest in creating more customers and their customers are really the sound healers or the sound therapists who buy the instruments and that and, and there's nothing wrong with that it's just doing business but they might be you know more um, encouraged to sell the instruments based on a construct uh, that has to do with some ancient you know Indian other construct called the chakra system or or whatever so there's a lot of information that gets churned around and repeated and refined and recycled and everything. And that's all out there too. It's in the, it's in the interwebs <laughs> and it's in books and people do talks on it and there's conferences about it and everything. So, you know, take, take it or leave it. You just take it with a grain of salt. Um, again, that stuff is not so important to me. I don't really care. Uh, you, people, it's like religion, you know, do what you want to do. It's okay. It's okay with me. Um, so that being said, uh, I think a lot of that is personal. And so when, when we enter into this kind of being of service relationship, just remember that we want to be respectful. We want to be um, ethical. And that means being responsible and being truthful of what you know and what you don't know. 
Uh, and there, and it's okay to say, I don't, I don't know about any of that. I'm, this is what I do. I'm just going to, I have these things. I want to play them. If you enjoy them, great. And that's what a friend of mine got a couple crystal bowls. And he, you know, that's what that was his attitude. And I thought that was really great. He just said, look, I'm not making any claims about any of this. I'm just going to do it. And you can, you know, see what happens. And I thought that was, that was right on. I do want to bring up a sensitive topic. And that is this idea of um, appropriation or misappropriation, as I like to call it. And I just want to give you an example of how we could uh, end up, you know, kind of stepping over into a ethically gray area, uh, ethical gray area. Um, when we purchase instruments from other countries um, or anything, when we, when we bring an item, we, 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 we get it, right? Because we paid for it and now it's ours, right? So we can do whatever we want, right? Um, if, if we're using an instrument or an item, uh, it doesn't have to be an instrument. You know, we, we can think of lots of instances where people from uh, one culture get something from another culture and then they just use it however they want um, based on their own beliefs and their own values and their own business goals. Um, we can end up um, unintentionally, I think a lot of this is just out of, you know, we just don't know, uh, unintentionally using that thing in a way that it would be perceived of as, as disrespectful or shocking or inappropriate um, within that original culture. And that's really what we're talking about when we talk about cultural appropriation. It's like if somebody came and visited, let's say they came and visited the United States, for example, and while they were here, they, they bought a flag and they thought, wow, that's really cool. I want to I ha have that. So they buy an American flag. And then later on, they're using it as a tablecloth or a picnic. They're just having a picnic and they're putting stuff on the flag because they like it. <laughs> now, think about that for a second. In this country, we don't even let the flag touch the ground. You're not even supposed to let it touch the ground. So I'm just painting that picture for you so that you can maybe relate to how something could be taken from one culture and then misappropriated or misused in another culture, in another context. And we just want to be like, you would hope, I, I would hope in that case, I could talk to those people and say, hey, you know what, that's our flag. We don't even let it touch the ground. Would you mind, you know, maybe not using it that way, you know, and if they were, if they were reasonable and, and considerate, which hopefully they are, they would say, oh, I didn't realize that. I, I, we won't do that. I'm just going to Enjoy it the way you enjoy it. I'll put it up on the wall or I'll put it on a flagpole. <laughs> and that's what we're talking about. And then if we take an instrument out of another culture, if we just because we can buy it uh, and now they're mine, right? If we do that, just try to bring some of that sensibility with you, bring some of the information, ask questions about, well, how are these used? What, what was the circumstance? And if something seems really sensitive or, or specific, uh, or like it could be infringing on some, you know, sensibilities from that other culture, just then reassess how you're going to use it, you know, do it with that knowledge, um, rather than just, oh, I saw it on a website, I clicked, I bought it, now it's mine, I'm just going to do whatever with these things, all right, because that, that can be an area where we don't know, I mean, I'm not blaming anybody for misappropriating something, usually it just happens by accident and out of ignorance, I've been on that too. I raise my hand, guilty. All right, so I'm not pointing my fingers at anyone, at myself. <laughs> okay, so what could you do to get into sound healing? First of all, um, I would say just like music, uh, anything with music, go as a as a customer. Go as a you know have a receptive experience. Go enjoy the services. Go check it out. Go to a sound bath. Go to a, a you know sound healer. Get a, get a healing, get a sound healing, see what it's like. Um, see, and then, you know, you can start to zero in on what, maybe what you want to do um, based on your own sensibilities, your own goals, and your pocketbook, because some of these things are expensive. Um, and then, uh, you know, move forward with some of the considerations that, that I've mentioned here, just information, ethics, um, walk the line, you know, you don't want to cross way over the line, making a lot of claims about things. I think that's just a good piece of advice about anything, including food and vitamins and supplements and gadgets. And, you know, if you want to provide a service, what I would recommend though, just like music is that if you're looking to facilitate any kind of, um, 
service, uh, provide a service, that you do it as a volunteer first, uh, and you do that for a while, and you get feedback, and you just just get into the shallow end of the pool, you know, get in the kiddie pool, and wait around a, bit, a little bit. Don't try to go up to the three meter diving board and be fancy schmancy and dive in the deep end, um, especially just because you can afford to buy the instruments. So that gets us back to full circle about the difference between some of these um, services. And that is that, like I said, the good news is with sound healing, virtually anybody can get into it and do it, um, which is kind of cool. You know, it's totally open. The downside of that is that everybody just gets into it um, because there are no real, uh, what's the word, uh, certification that that is um, there's nothing legal there's no legal requirements um largely because you're really not you're not working in the healthcare industry you know so we don't really have as many ethical considerations uh, but if you were going to hire just to put yourself in this position for a second if you were going to hire somebody to provide services for your parent or your child or your spouse what would you want to know about that person providing the service? Would you want them to be, you know, to have some certification qualifications, um, you know, maybe some oversight uh, so that you know that they're, you know, ethical and, and honest and that you're getting a, a, a solid product uh, for your money. Um, so just think about that from both ends of that transaction um, and, then, and then do whatever you feel is the best thing to do. But I would recommend just to get into it uh, get some services. And I've, you know, I've had some sound healing experiences myself, both in a group like gong baths and then individually with things like a monochord tables. And they were all awesome. It was great. I mean, it's, it's actually really nice. It's like I said, it is like a spa. It's like having a spa experience. So at the very least, um, go ahead and check it out. And then if you want to bring in more music, uh, on the musical side, you can do that as well. Look, none of these things are discreet. None of these things are are owned, you know, by any individuals. Um, I have a friend who's an excellent percussionist, drummer, plays in bands, plays drum set, also does sound healing. Uh, and I know a lot of people that, that kind of cross over into both realms, including me. I, I've often done both uh, ends of the spectrum because it's all good and it's all awesome. And just being of service through music and sound is a good thing to do. All right. I hope this has been helpful. If you'd like to leave some kind and helpful comments below, you can do that. And if you have other comments for me, message me and we can go deeper into the conversation. If I can be of help, that's my main uh, goal. So thanks for being here and thinking about how you can be of help to other people through sound and music. I'll see you soon.